Yeah, hey, and welcome back to the Seabase channel. And uh, it's once more about Corona. But this time it's about the Corona apps and uh, the data protection in decentralized Corona apps. And uh, Kirsten and Rainer will do a talk about uh, looking beyond the code. Uh, as always, you can ask questions in the chat, which we will uh, answer later on. And um, now have uh, fun and uh, lots of information with uh, Rainer and Kirsten. Go ahead. Thanks a lot. So welcome to our talk, Data Protection of Decentralized Corona Apps, Looking Beyond the Code. Um, this is a talk specifically about data protection and not so much about IT security, as we have heard uh, a lot of interesting talks before. And um, yes, so... This is the schedule for today, um, and uh, so, um, mm -hmm. and we will start with the introduction of us. And uh, Kirsten, maybe you can say a few words about yourself. Thank you, thank you so much for having us today. Um, my name is Kirsten. I'm a data protection expert and I work for a German DPA. I have a legal background. I tweet under privacy DE and I was part of the team for a German exposure notification app data protection impact assessment draft in April. Um, and today I will present my private opinion. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Rainer Rehak. Um, I have a background in computer science uh, and philosophy. Um, I am a researcher at the Weizmann Institute for the Networked Society. Uh, I'm active at the com uh, Forum Computer Professionals for Peace and Social Responsibility. Um, and my fields of interest are data protection and IT security, uh, as well as government hacking. And I was uh, part of the team together with uh, Kirsten uh, to create the data protection impact assessment in April. And um, now uh, we will have a short overview about the talk. Yes, um, first we will start with, with what is data protection? Quite important uh, question when, when talking about data protection to understand the basic subject. And then we will learn some details about the German Corona app, uh, which is actually an exposure notification app. We will learn a bit about what is a data protection impact assessment, our findings and what was missing in the official data protection impact assessment. And finally, we will have some time for open questions. But first, let us start with what is data protection? Rainer. So first, um, we would like to differentiate uh, with the question, what is data protection between data protection, data protection law, and IT security. Data protection itself is a research area in social science. The idea there, or the, the goal, is to avoid unwanted consequences of data processing. Um, data protection law is the legal field that tries to implement that but it's the legal form of it. And we all know sometimes uh, the laws don't really protect what they're intended to protect. So there's a difference between data protection and data protection law. And uh, the third thing that needs to be differentiated is IT security, which is a research area in computer science, um, which is mainly about confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data and services. And um, we see here there's already, um, there's already a differentiation because um, the data protection itself uh, protects the people that are subject to data processing, whereas IT security protects the data and systems of the people operating the systems. So you see, we already see there's a first, uh, there's a first difference. And um, um, the current uh, data protection law is the UGDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and it protects the fundamental rights of people, see Article 1, I've put it out there, uh, the regulation lays down rules relate, uh, relating to the protection of natural persons, and it protects the fundamental rights and freedoms of natural persons. Um, and generally in, uh, in uh, the data protection law in the GDPR, the main questions are um, the processing itself, the purpose, the risks involved, and who is the controller, so who is responsible, um, and such things. Um, 
And one thing that needs to be mentioned, especially uh, when we talk about uh, the, the any kind of processing, is questions of proportionality, so, uh, suitability, and necessity. So for all data protection processes, it's important to ask, is, um, is this data processing suitable to reach the aim? So is there a causal relationship? We all know uh, that there are certain applications where that are intended to reach a certain goal, but we maybe as tech people, um, or tech people, might not all be tech people listening or watching here, um, sometimes it's just not suitable. So from the perspective of data protection, this would then not be a legal processing if it doesn't causally relate to the aim. The necessity is, um, is there any less intrusive measure to reach the same goal then the proposed one is not uh, is not allowed because less uh, uh, infringing uh, one or less intrusive one would be available. And finally, the proportionality. So the goals that can be reached compared to the rights infringed, that needs to be put in uh, in context and in relation. And um, uh, this is uh, this kind of uh, understanding or this kind of evaluation has to be done for all processing. So right now we see that's the first problem with the corona uh, uh, with the exposure notification being done by the co uh, corona one apps. We don't really know how well it actually works, which in effect makes it difficult to make this kind of evaluation. Um, but uh, if we leave this a little bit away, it's still very interesting, and this is what we will uh, continue to do now, is to evaluate the risk of the actual usage. Um, but um, And there's also a specific tool, so we it's not like people sitting around the table and just thinking about the risks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, beautiful. All right. Oh. Uh oh. Is that okay again? All right. So I feel a bit like an aeroplane that has been refueled in mid flight. Okay. So should I. Okay. Should I continue or. Okay, maybe um, we'll probably. We'll skip this probably in the recording then. So, right now, I could sing the Jeopardy melody. <laughs> There we are. Okay. Wow, this was uh, quick. Should I continue now? Okay. All right. So, um, as I said, it's necessary to analyze all this processing. And for this kind of analy uh, analysis, uh, there's a specific tool in the GDPR, um, which we will hear about later uh, by Kirsten. But first, before we uh, talk about the tool, um, we want to talk about the Corona app itself, just to outline the general uh, functionality for everyone who's not familiar. This will be rather quick but uh, it's important for people who are not uh, constantly dealing with the topic. So what's the Corona Warn app? It's a voluntary transnational uh, Bluetooth um, low energy proximity, proximity tracing. Um, it's the same technology or, that's being used by, for example, the app in Ireland, in Japan, or in Italy, uh, um, etc. The purpose of this app is to break infection chains by warning possible infectious exposures. So it tries to trace contacts between people, and if uh, one of the persons um, um, 
is tested positively, then uh, the second one, so the contact can be warned uh, for uh, self um uh, quarantining. Um, the whole system, although we are always talking about the Corona app, it consists of an app and a server, which is important looking at it from the data protection, pers uh, data protection perspective. And there are more things, but uh, because of time, we're not focusing on this. Um, within the app, there are two buckets, like two, um, let's say, storages. Um, one bucket is for the Bluetooth beacons that are being sent by each app. And one of the buckets is for the Bluetooth beacons received by other apps. Those Bluetooth beacons are, uh, um, let's say, pseudo-random and they change, but this should not be the topic right now. And um, the, interesting, uh, the interesting aspect is upon a positive test of one person, um, the Bluetooth beacons that have been sent in this one bucket are uploaded to the server. And then all the other apps are regularly downloading all those beacons from the server and they can check with their second bucket if they have seen any of the infected buckets. So that's kind of the idea. So the warning um, is, um, um, is being calculated uh, decentrally on the, on the apps, on the mobile phones themselves. And if there's a warning, so if it detects you have been close to someone who has been later tested positive, then you should self-quarantine. That's the basic idea. Um, and as we see, this is a, let's say, um, transnational um, um, effort for contact tracing. This is a new technology and it's just uh, difficult to assess this. And as I've mentioned before, um, there is a tool to do this in a structured way. Uh, so now Kirsten will tell us uh, what a data protection impact assessment is and what we can do with this. Thank you. Um, the data protection impact assessment is a legal requirement resulting from Article 35 of the uh, General Data Protection uh, Regulation, which describes in which situation a data protection impact assessment must be conducted and uh, also the obligations a controller has to comply with whenever uh, a data protection impact assessment becomes necessary uh, and needs to be conducted prior to processing. Uh, to assess the impact of fundamental rights of new types of processing, technologies, large amount of data or processing on a large scale of special categories like health data as collected via the, the um, exposure notification apps. Um, the, the aim of a, a DPR, what we call it as an abbreviation, is to aim to detect uh, problematic collection and linkage of information and to prevent them by implementing appropriate measures or to prevent the processing as such if it bears the risk of the resulting in profiling and other high risks for fundamental rights uh, of natural persons. Um, so profiling and its consequences constitutes grim infringement of fundamental rights and um, therefore uh, it is quite important uh, to, to find uh, all kinds of processing that uh, may lead to such a profiling and to such risks, of course. Um, and to allocate uh, these risks properly, it is important um, not only to focus on the app, but to focus on the whole process. So um, uh, including uh, the interfaces, of course, that an app uses, but uh, also uh, um, the, 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 the processing operations that are very closely connected and that uh, only give sense to having uh, such a, a, um, a notification app at all. And uh, the problem with the main problem with the official uh, German uh, data protection impact assessment was that it, it uh, basically focuses on the app and the server uh, and leaves out very important aspects of uh, the processing. And that, for example, is the Google Apple, Apple exposure notification. Um, and uh, we still, up to this day, don't know exactly what is going on uh, when, when this uh, feature is being included and used uh, um, in the app. So this is, this is uh, quite a shortcoming. Mm. Another uh, main focus of a data protection impact assessment is that a controller uh, may also be the main attacker uh, and not 
not only third persons or uh, external persons that may attack uh, the processing operation. So um, when you conduct a data protection impact assessment, you always have to focus on, uh, you know, does the controller actually need this kind of data? Is it necessary? And uh, does he have in place the appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure that he's only processing what he actually uh, uh, needs to to um, to, to, to follow and uh, to conclude the, the main objectives of the processing. Um, actually, there are not many uh, data protection impact assessments around so far. Um, and uh, as a consequence, in Germany, um, there was, or I don't know if it, what was the consequence, but at, at, as uh, shortly before um, the Corona app was being published, it was clear that um, there was no public data protection impact assessment and that uh, um, data subjects ha had not been included in the process of the assessment, which is a prerequisite uh, from Article 35. Um, so we decided in April um, to uh, go on and analyze what was known at that time uh, about, the, about the app uh, and provide what you might call a draft of uh, a uh, data protection impact assessment, and which then actually served as a background for the official um, uh, impact assessment done by, by the government as being the controller of the whole processing. Um, our findings in that, um, in that data protection uh, assessment was that um, there is quite a uh, a difference um, in terms of voluntariness uh, when you consider, you know, a, a voluntary using an app uh, and uh, um, uh, and 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 uh, in, in different uh, uh, under different preconditions and um, also uh, the question of voluntariness in terms of the legal basis, because voluntary, voluntary doesn't necessarily mean consent as a legal basis, which is one of the legal basis that is provided by the GDPR, and um, which, uh, which could be used. But there's also uh, the option um, of a voluntary use based on a specific law. And this would have uh, a, a number of, of positive consequences. Um, uh, as opposed to consent being the legal basis. Because according to a data protection law, legal basis, which is always required when you process personal data, um, we found that consent is not an appropriate uh, legal basis because it requires you to be uh, to, to, to take to take uh, to, or to consent freely in an informed way uh, and uh, that were that were conditions requirements that would have to be or still have to be met by each and every individual user in order um, to to be a, a legally valid uh, consent. And this, as you can guess, is, is quite quite a, a, a difficult uh, task uh, to 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 make sure um, that every user of the app actually chooses to use it freely uh, and informed. Um, so it would have much, uh, much been much better uh, if uh, the government would have decided to provide a specific, specific law um, for the voluntary use and uh, also to put down uh, uh, the purposes, specify the purposes and uh, center them on contact tracing exclusively and to preclude other uses such as, you know, using the app as an intern entrance token for supermarkets, for example, concerts, workplaces, um, and so on. And actually, today we see the same discussion um, now uh, uh, concerning um, the vaccination, um, where, where also we find that, you know, being, have, have, being or having also already received uh, the vaccine may be used as an entrance token. And therefore, um, we believe also for the Corona One app that an app uh, that, sorry, um, that a law should have been in place uh, to govern this. <clears throat> it also uh, could have actually uh, uh, also 
um, worked for, <coughs> excuse me, much higher acceptance uh, and proper usage of the app. Um, well, and another uh, one of our big findings, and, and this is something that has always been uh, uh, discussed in public also, and um, is whether the question whether the app is working uh, on an anonymous basis. Uh, and in our data protection uh, impact assessment, uh, we show that um, the, the, the app indeed processes personal health data and this, uh, that generally no data on a personal, uh, personally used smartphone is anonymous. So uh, we always have to deal with data protection issues in this regard, and we shouldn't be talking about an anonymous use of uh, the app. Um, and that's uh, basically why in data protection, uh, we cannot only look at the code used um, for such a processing, but we have to take the whole processing context uh, into consideration. Um, and well, uh, Rainer, how yes. about anonymization? Yes, I will take uh, on with the last two points. Um, um, that we now have seen that um, the app itself is not anonymous, it doesn't mean that parts of the data at par within parts of the processing can be anonymize, uh, anonymized. So um, the whole idea here is uh, once, uh, as long as the data is on the mobile phones, it is uh, personal data. Well, you can imagine if I, if I can read out uh, all those tokens and then I can compare them with, the, um, with those tokens maybe saved on the server, I could theoretically uh, make a combination and then say who's uh, if the phone I, I took from someone if if that person is actually infected or not. So that shows uh, that it's that the data connection is there. Um, but uh, this doesn't mean that on the way of uploading those those uh, Bluetooth uh, beacons to the server, it would not be possible to anonymize that. But this is a difficult process. It is possible that those personal data on the phones is being uploaded and uh, goes through an anonymization process and then is anonymous on the server. So this is exactly the data protection view um, where you would say there is a part of the process where the same data, which is personal data on the phone, it is anonymous data when, when it's on the server. But the process, how it gets there, is very, very important. Um, as uh, you might uh, think now, well, if you upload those, well, after you have a positive test and then you upload um, via the app uh, your Bluetooth beacons to the server, of course the server receives it and has your IP address. So by this point, it's of course possible to connect via IP address, um, and IP address is personal data, uh, those uploaded beacons to uh, an individual. So what does, uh, what does Telecom uh, and SAP say at this point? Um, and what they say in the data protection impact assessment is, uh, yeah, for an indefinitely small amount of time, we do have this connection, but we actually don't save it. Trust us, we don't save it. And here we see again, uh, there's uh, the, the main difference. If you see the controller is the attacker, then of course you should not trust the attacker saying, well, of course I'm not saving this. Um, so th that's that's the main problem, um, but of course this uh, this risk can be mitigated, but it should be mitigated. Um, one way we are suggesting in, a, in the data protection impact assessment would be to say, well, maybe you have this uh, the server who stores it is, is within a network, but the entrance node to the network is operated by a different organization, and all this all uh, the main task this other organization has is to strip the IT IP addresses and then forward the data to the servers of, uh, let's say, uh, the RKI. So this would be an organizational solution. This is not a technical solution, but it still is a protection for the data subjects. And that's why, uh, hence the talk, uh, this, you can't really see this in the code because this would be part of the network design. And there we see we have always have to look at the, at the whole processing. Um, and at the same time, uh, it would be nice, for example, as a, as a protection measure to have a law that forbids um, law enforcement or intelligence agencies going to those organizations to say, well, could you just keep those logs on for a short time because we need this information for whatever reason. So it would be a good idea to have a law that prohibits this kind of change of purpose. So there we see that 
it is possible to do anonymization of those Bluetooth beacons while they're uploaded, but it has to be done properly and should not be, as in the official data protection impact assessment, brushed away by saying, well, we just don't save this information. You know, we all know mistakes happen. That's, that's the least uh, um, um, dangerous scenario we can see. Uh, malintent will be something else. And the last point um, that we found is, uh, as Kirsten already uh, mentioned a little bit, um, the exposure notification framework uh, and the relation to Apple and Google. Of course, we would know uh, that's a really, really um, crucial aspect, and we would not say you should not use it, but it's, it should be honestly stated that there is a risk, and this risk has to be mitigated. The official data protection impact assessment says, well, we can't access the source code, so it should not be, so that, because it's not solvable, it's not a problem. No, the, the, uh, the task of an uh, impact assessment would be to say there is a risk, and because of uh, closed source code at this point, it's not possible to mitigate this risk. So... It's okay if this cannot be solved, but it should be stated as that. And that's, that's a big problem. Um, if we just say, yeah, everything is like it is, and so we can't change it, and so everything is all right, then why do we do data protection, right? Um, and um, um, yeah, and it would be certainly possible to ask maybe data protection agencies should audit, should be able to audit the code of Apple and Google, um, or maybe it would be possible to. Um, uh, to find other ways. And since we spent several um, um, 10 millions on this app, it's frankly quite surprising that the team about the MicroG project uh, presented a free implementation of the ENF, at least for um, uh, Android, and suddenly people without any Google connection can use it on their Android phones. And I was just thinking, okay, if this is one, if they would understand how crucial this role is, at least you could rescue the Android users, you know. In, in this aspect. But there are many other ways as well how to, how to do it. Um, but this would be a consequence if you would take data protection really seriously. And this is not, uh, this is not some, some fancy magic. Um, this is just data protection done seriously. Um, right. Okay, uh, so this is um, so maybe at this point uh, props to the MicroG uh, project and maybe apart from our data protection impact assessment, uh, do donate to those guys uh, to actually make this app better and more usable uh, and more broadly usable um, to people. Okay, um, so uh, now Kirsten will continue with some of the open questions. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, apart from technological issues, proportionality of processing, uh, we believe should still or again be discussed. You know, what, what is the added value of uh, the app for contract tracing? Uh, we don't know up to this point. Um, it seems still an experiment. Uh, we, if we look at other countries, especially in the Asia Pacific area, we see that contract tracing uh, by an app has actually not been uh, a major uh, 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 tool to, to fight the pandemic. Um, we should uh, take a closer look at the side effects of surveillance habituation of the populations to a surveillance tool. Uh, I, I believe this is a, a real big problem, um, which hasn't been considered at all. You know, using a, a, a smartphone to to being you know traced and and to have uh, 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 you know to 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 know that somebody's looking over your shoulder and who, who whom you are meeting, even though uh, it seems to be uh, uh, on a on a beacon uh, on a beacon kind of way. Um, it, it's, it, it's still something that affects your brain. Um, and the fact uh, that other smartphone apps, you know, this is always an argument or, or, or something that's brought forward, uh, that, that smartphone apps illegally spy on users does not justify uh, that this app does uh, for, uh, for, for the purpose of contract tracing. Um, it's not a no-go, but uh, we believe that uh, proportionality has to be carefully, very carefully considered, and that is, it has not been done properly so far. Well, this is from my side. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I'll, I'll just take on the, the next point. Um, um, maybe just one comment, right? When we refer to the, uh, to, um, uh, the corona 
approach in countries like Taiwan, which is not the, the, the mega surveillance state, uh, it's a democratic country, so um, um, they don't even have an app, right? So this is, uh, so, so, okay, but coming back, so and uh, even if we, now we have the app and now we, um, we all want to see it flourish, the question is, um, why is the development still so deficitary or so deficit? Where is the functionality about the crowd not notifier? Uh, this, the, uh, the draft is already there, the source code is nearly written. So um, to have another uh, data field, which is um, a crowd. So whenever you go to a restaurant, you could maybe scan a QR code. There's a possible way of actually implementing this in a data protection friendly way. Um, why is the micro G approach not uh, gotten part of the official app? So once it finds you don't have Google or anything installed, then it will be using this uh, um, um, uh, this functionality. So uh, you know where where did all the millions go? And the other point is still, um, as mentioned before, where are the anonymous uploads? Why is, isn't that done properly? If it's if it could be solved or at least uh, mitigated by some more or less simple uh, network configuration. And finally, where is the law um, again that prohibits any other use of the data? And um, finally, we would like to close um, with the mentioning uh, that this exposure notification um, is can also be seen by a tech-based distraction from those uh, societal problems that lie, uh, lie below. We have too little testing, we lack staff and health agencies and hospitals, we have bad political rules. So if people stick to the rules that are being given out, then we are still in the catastrophe and the result right now is, let's say, the, um, the head of, our, uh, of our, um, the uh, Robert Koch Institute just um, uh, praying to people they should do other things and I'm just asking what well, well if people stick to the rules and it's still uh, all going into the catastrophe then the rules are just bad um, uh, praying shouldn't be part of a political strategy um, uh, the reporting infrastructure is still not fully in place uh, we have a check a lack of checks for quarantine people uh, after traveling or during quarantine so all those things uh, I think have to be kept in mind um, especially when the discussion comes again, when th some people who know nothing about data protection start screaming that we should lose data protection. Um, first, they don't understand anything about the data protection, and second, they obviously don't understand anything about the problem we are trying to solve here and the societal and political background. So this is usually the point um, we'd like to close with. Uh, if you want to te use technology with your, for your societal problems, you have not understood technology and you have not understood society. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, now we're here for questions and uh, maybe remarks if you want. Some links. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much, Kirsten and Rainer, for this talk. Uh, yeah, I guess the Corona app will. Uh, follow us through the next year. <laughs> will suddenly follow me. So you think uh, there'll be major changes made or you think there's only <coughs> small adjustments to be made? What's your, yeah, what's, what's your guess? What's your uh, wish? Mm -hmm. What's your shout out to the programmers and users? Um, Kirsten, maybe you want to answer first? Well, uh I, I think it's awfully quiet around uh, at least the German uh, notification app. Uh, I, I would have supposed that uh, they would have put much more uh, efforts into um, making this app more usable, user more user friendly, uh, solving some of the irritation that pop up uh, uh, occasionally and uh, also look into the privacy issues a bit more to, to gain more trust and to gain more acceptance. Uh, how about you, Rainer? Yeah, well, I think I would expect to see only small steps because um, to me it seems that actually Telekom and SAP uh, um, took the chance and I don't know, uh, if the people who negotiated those deals, if they did not put in any more developments. So I guess uh, in a normal economic thinking, uh, it would be normal that um, Telecom and SAP now just say, well, if you want more functions, well, you have to take another contract and we know how much you need it. So um, I think we only see small steps. I mean, the revolution that has been rolled out right now is a diary where you can write down when you have met someone. I don't know. Uh, so I think... 
Um, I think we see small steps, but uh, I think um, there are many good ideas already floating around. Um, and I hope to see them there. I don't know, maybe you, again, we have to rely on the open source and free software community to maybe to implement that. I don't know, maybe there will be a fork. <laughs> I don't know. No idea. <laughs> All right, there's, there's no questions in the, uh, in the chat right now. But uh, yeah, anything else you want to <coughs> say to our viewers? Or um, <laughs> yeah, first, uh, everyone should stay as healthy as possible. Um, I would probably say <coughs> um, when we discuss about those apps and about those technical solutions, I think um, it's always important to see that you can um, criticize something without being totally against it. So um, even within our group of the six, uh, let's say, researchers who built this data protection impact assessment, we were not, we didn't have the same opinion about all those things. So I can say the app should be much better and there are major deficits still going on and I'm still using it. So I think it's not impossible to have exactly this opinion. Maybe other people might criticize it and not use it. So I think it's a, this differentiated approach, I think, is very important because many of the problems that we're trying to solve right now, uh, the lacking staff in the health um, 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 environment or in the, in the health agencies or in the hospitals, this is nothing we can solve within two months now. So maybe the app can be one small part and it is possible to be, to say in this emergency moment, it might be an okay idea and not forgetting that we still have to do a lot of homework. So this kind of differentiation, I think, is, at least for me, quite important. Yeah, I mean, we're from the dystopian future society. So the question is, for the next big thing that comes, for the next virus, uh, you think this is a good base we're working on? <laughs> with where, where only little details... like. I mean, I'm just talking about the app. Of course, right, right. Mars and all, all the rest of the shit has to be done. Uh, no question about that. But maybe the next virus works a little different. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we have an open source base to, to build the app for the, for the next plague? Well, <laughs> I think we're, we're well equipped now. But I think it's also important um, to, to see... Um, I don't know, Kristen, if you want to say something, just just maybe three sentences from me. Uh, uh, I think it's still not too late to try to avoid the next plague. So maybe uh, we um, we intrude into less areas of animals, which we have not before. Maybe always, lose always the best thing to get rid of exactly. problems, not even start them, yes. Exactly. So maybe we treat our resources uh, more fairly and we treat them like we need them because we actually do need them. So I think uh, those big pictures, uh, we should, I mean, right now everyone is in emergency mode with thousands of people dying. Uh, but, you know, I think there's quite a connection between the, the climate breakdown, global warning question uh, um, and those pandemic things. And I think this is uh, so, um, yeah. But maybe, Kirsten, you want to say something as well to this? Well, I think it's always important to take a step back and look at the broader picture um, and uh, with with such an app and maybe a next pandemic uh, uh, um, on the horizon, um, which we all hope is is not the scenario that we will be facing, um, but is is to to make sure um, that that if if we use uh, our technical tools for contract tracing, that that we go away after the pandemic, that we have measures in place to make them actually go away. Uh, and also, in the meantime, uh, to prepare uh, um, to prepare to have so technical solutions um, in a in a in a privacy friendly way, uh, in a way that uh, that doesn't infringe into fundamental rights, um, and that are uh, that that may not be uh, misused, uh, even though maybe if there is a change in government, for example. Um, so it should be something that you 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 can maybe the user uh, himself can switch off or or at least cannot be easily uh, implemented again, not updated, not be mandatory. Uh, I think this is this is these are quite important uh, questions, and um, I think in our talk we we have mentioned a couple of issues of societal issues. Um, 
that we will have to discuss in the future uh, with pandemic or without uh, um, the questions of surveillance, I, I think are questions uh, that that uh, that are are uh, are to be discussed in a, in a in a free or in a society that is based on freedom. Okay, so this is basically the demands that the hackers have since uh, I don't know the eighties. Keep it decentralized. Right. Keep it anonymized. Make sure uh, it doesn't get data that uh, doesn't need. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and I have I have a suggestion for this, this dystopian use of this app. Uh, I think after this pandemic is over, it will be called uh, the loneliness app, and it will trace your contacts and it will warn you if you have too little contact. <laughs> that's that's very nice uh, thought. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you, Kirsten and Rainer. And, thank uh, you so much. We'll do a, a yeah, a little little uh, change in the setup, and we'll repeat a talk uh, from Peggy Salop about audibles, which will be on at uh, sixteen thirty, as far as I know. So uh, see you back soon. Bis gleich. <laughs>